Next in our series is Dr. Javier Perez Fernandez. Um, Dr. Perez Fernandez is the chief of the Department of Critical Care at Baptist Hospital. Um, he has uh, trained um, in Puerto Rico internal medicine and then did his fellowship in uh, critical care uh, with Dr. Phil Dellinger and, um, in Chicago at Rush Presbyterian in Chicago. He is right now a manager of a large group of critical care physicians um, in the South Florida Critical Care Services. He oversees the operation of seven ICUs um, with over 350 day, uh, beds. He has um, extreme experience um, in the administration of management of leader of um, ICUs. He's recognized as a leader during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, he's been in multiple TV appearances and uh, he's also um, a speaker in the national and international um, forum. And uh, he has recently published uh, Critical Care Administration, a clinical guide, um, along with our friend, Dr. Jorge Hidalgo. So he will be talking to us following in the theme of disaster preparedness and augmenting ICU capacity. Welcome, Dr. Perez Fernandez. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rodriguez. And thank you everybody for the kind invitation and um, have the opportunity to be here and share with you some of the aspects of, uh, of augmenting ICU capacity in these times of uh, crisis that we have to live. Now, what we are gonna be speaking is uh, something that applies to pretty much every disaster and Dr. Doyle has done as well. However, um, I think uh, none of us have uh, lived through a disaster of the magnitude of the one that we have uh, um, currently experiencing. And, and obviously the last year, um, that's, been, uh, that's been a dramatic uh, uh, year for all of us. And um, so it is really something that has tested every possible idea that we had about uh, crisis management and preparation for disaster. So for several years, Dr. Rodriguez Vega uh, Dr. Hidalgo and myself have been involved in the participation of the Fundamental Disaster Management, a course that has been um, promoted by the Society of Critical Care Medicine, and it's been translated to many languages. The idea with the course was to prepare some of the uh, administrators and ICUs uh, to cope with disasters. Now, as Dr. Boyle has said before me, uh, most of the disasters had, um, had been located to a regional area or had been located to a particular time so there have been sequential in time and they're being essentially localized or, or, or contained in an area, a geographic area in the world. This is uh, by our bad uh, essential experience has been a national and international and worldwide disaster that affected everybody pretty much at the same time. And that's challenged and tested our capacity okay. for the right to see. You have to direct me. I'm not, I'm not prepared for this kind of disasters. I'm so sorry. Okay, so I apologize for that. But anyway, so let's move on to what's going on with our preparation. What can we do to make our search capacity for ICU? How can we make our ICUs um, capable to adapt to more patients than expected, to more patients than what we do? Now, this is what's happening right now in, in probably one of the fear situations that we have for, for the pandemic is is India with, with a population exceeding 1.2 billion people, American billions, and then suddenly um, with the need for over 500,000 ICU beds, 500,000 ICU beds, and, and over 350 medical staff. Um, that's, that's what they're looking at right now. And, and this is based on the government estimation and, and most of the uh, agency's estimation on India. Now, this is obviously a very important issue because when, when we had this in the US as well, and this is a, a USA Today on December 14, 2020, as we mentioned before by our previous speaker, uh, the, the importance of the ventilators and the ICU units. And there's been a significant uh, difference when you have ICU that takes care of the patients with ICU personnel versus non-specialized personnel and non-specialized equipment because the, the, the mortality has been surpassing then the expected mortality and, and the, the, the ability 
the ability of uh, of coping with the disaster has been obviously uh, unbelievably uh, unbelievably different. Now, obviously, these are reports coming from the Toronto Herald, the USA Today, showing showing that uh, the mortality is significantly higher when you have no ICU beds, and and that's what really brings us to decide how we're going to make it, how we're going to increase our capacity. And this is the, the rule that we have on ICUs, the four S's, staff, staff, space, and structure. Now, we need to increase our staff, to increase our staff, that means the equipment, the, the, the different devices, the medications. But then also an important issue becomes the space. Where are we going to place all these patients? And finally, at the structure, because this is as important as the rest of the issues that we discuss, and we'll talk about it in a little bit. So let's talk a little bit about medical services. That's the staff. Now, we can have new intensivists dealing with ICU, new anesthesiologists dealing with anesthesia in, in just one week. So we need to look into how we're going to expand our services, medical services, without having the opportunity to have adequately or completely trained individuals. And then the definition on who is doing what everybody is doing is a very important issue. So who is going to be doing what? And so if we have a group of anesthesiologists looking into a number of surgeries. Obviously, every anesthesiologist is not going to be able to carry or to handle 100 different patients. So the issue becomes then how we're going to divide that and who is going to be doing what. And then the possibility to use different type of uh, uh, personnel, such as advanced registered nurses. We do have them in the US. So in the US, we have a nurse that is taking a particular course, specialized in a particular element of the care, and is an advanced registered nurse. And, and that really keeps us a little bit of more layout as far as expanding our medical services. Then the issues come in emergency probabilities. Now, this has been something that happened when a localized or a regional disaster had occurred. So such as a hurricane or, or a flooding or a tsunami in which uh, the different clinicians, physicians or nurses from different countries have been allowed to work in a particular area for this emergency time. Now, the pandemic has brought us uh, over 12 months of emergency worldwide, and that's been obviously an issue. Now, and then it becomes also the training. And the training includes the preparation of non-specialized personnel and how to do that on normal times, not in emergency times, and how to prepare those possible personnel to work into an ICU or an OR type of uh, element if the necessity occurs, like it happened during this time. So courses such as the fundamental disaster management or specific courses that can lead into a basic training, a basic training of some of the things that we need in the ICU as an example, could be essential in this particular uh, in this particular time. So let's talk a little bit about capacity and capability. Those are two different elements. Obviously, capacity refers more to a space and, and the opportunity to do things. So it could be, for example, time capacity, how much time you have in your hands, versus capability, how, how, how many things you're capable to do. And when I mean capable, I mean exactly the right way capable. And, and that's what we divide. This is an example that the Society of Critical Care Medicine has used uh, from time to time when, um, regarding the use of personnel, non-specialized personnel during the pandemic. And you can see that an ICU critical care physician is able to manage this way up to 100 beds, pretty much. So we're looking at 96 beds through the ability to use an ICU advanced nurse practitioner, which is what it says there, ICU APP, or a non-ICU physician. So every non-ICU physician or an advanced ICU nurse will take care of 24 beds, essentially, using different personnel, such as non-specialized ICU personnel, non-specialized ICU physicians, and, and ICU nurses that you can see there how the tier goes down to down. And this is very important because a single ICU physician can manage up to almost, again, 100 beds. And this becomes a very important way or a very essential way to increase capacity for our ICUs. Now, 
Your nurses are a very important in the scarcity element when we're looking into an ICU service. And an ICU nurse can essentially supervise for non-ICU nurses. It can be also the leader of a team composed by respiratory therapists or assistant personnel or patients, outpatient assistant personnel. Our ORs is an example, and, and our hospital contains 76, 76 uh, operating rooms. Our ORs were practically closed during the pandemic, during the peak of the pandemic. We have significant number of personnel that was not being utilized, and there was essentially to provide increasing services on the ICU level, but they needed to be supervised by our ICU nurses and our ICU personnel. Otherwise, this will not have worked correctly. The supplies, the stuff, this is what we call the stuff, supplies. One of the problems that Professor Doyle has mentioned is when we look into the ones on the bottom of the page, common medication, research drugs, you can stockpile them, but you can have a million bags of saline solution in your storage. The question is, it expires and you have to be changing them. And one of the problems becomes again, how do you deal with an office storage? And how do you, how do you maintain that and your ability to maintain your buildings? And number two, how are you gonna maintain those medications? Sometimes medications that are not necessarily in use on a daily basis. And how do you maintain it up to date without expiring and to what cost? So who can do that? And that's very difficult sometimes. Ventilators, oxygen, sedation, research drugs, common medications. There was a moment during the pandemic that in our hospital, in a single facility, not in the total hospitals that we manage, but in a single facility that we have 190 patients on a ventilator and 190 patients that were ventilated plus we had over 800 patients using oxygen, more than the usual amount of oxygen, looking at from venturi mass to high flow. So everyone was using at least 15 liters of oxygen. Can you imagine? Because your oxygen pipelines might not be ready to handle that amount of oxygen. And we really had to do some remodeling, emergency remodeling in some of the areas of the hospital because our oxygen capacity was not able to pipe every single liter of oxygen needed in every room at the same time. And this is something that we've never really experienced before. And of course, it goes into the ventilators and we'll talk about it in a second. And, and everything else that we already mentioned, some of those aspects such as sedation, research drugs and common medications. Well, the ventilators are essentially one thing that was very popular during the entire pandemic and continues being a popular on-demand element. The standard ventilators are all known and they're obviously capable to do amazing things. But then we have the transport and portable ventilators. And, and, and I say they are something that includes a strategic national stockpile. And then some, some individual says, well, okay, so if we don't have more ventilators, we're gonna use anesthesia machines. Now, anesthesia machines are a complicated element to use as a ventilator for ICU. They require adapting the machine to the ICU, cannot be used just simple as that. It also requires some changing on some of the circuits and filters continuously, which is not really what typically we do in the ICU with our ventilators. And they're limited as far as the operator as well. And so not all anesthesia machines can be used, number one. And number two, not all might be able to be handled by someone that knows how to do it. And number three, um, it requires some more maintenance and, and experience to do things with them as opposed to ventilators. So ICU personnel are typically not qualified to manage anesthesia machines. And that also becomes a little bit of an issue. So we discover and the hard way that we're not really having so many ventilators as we thought we had, because again, with having 78 OR rooms, we thought that we had a hundred more ventilators, but that was not true. And then we have converted non-invasive ventilator equipment that we can convert into uh, ICU, but remember the BiPAPs that you convert into uh, ventilators, they're not volume cycle, they're just pressure cycle and they're pressure limited. So it becomes a little bit of a challenge. It's not as simple as I'll connect someone to an invasive ventilator using a BiPAP and I'll leave them alone. And disasters happen frequently because of that. So it requires a different attention. So we have to be creative with ventilators. 
In the US, we have something prior to the pandemic that was called the National Strategic Stockpile. This was created many years ago and the Cold War, and it was essentially developed in different towns in the US. It's managed by the National Guard, and it was a great resource because the National Strategic Stockpile had 18,000 ventilators available prior to the pandemic. But the problem is this. So these are different storages or warehouses where the National Stockpile uh, keeps their elements. Elements include um, protective equipment, include medications, and include equipment such as ventilators uh, on oxygen as well. These are the type of ventilators. They come by on a, on a yellow uh, um, kind of luggage type. And, and those are typically the ones that we have, uh, you know, either the, the uh, LPVs or, or the iVents. You have the more modern. The problem with these ventilators is that they're not thought to maintain people with ARDS. It's as simple as that. They are great element when you have a mass casualty and you have to perform. Dr. Doyle had said a few minutes ago, you have to perform surgeries and maintain people alive after surgery in the, in, uh, in the field or transport them from the field to a larger hospital or, or maintain people alive for quite time. But they're not, they're not prepared to do complicated ventilator maneuvers as our ventilators. And they're not prepared to do peak compliance curves. They're not prepared to do inverse ratio ventilation the right way. They're not complaining to do, you know, recruitment maneuvers. And, and those are ventilators that are not to maintain people with the RDS. So we found that despite the availability of this type of ventilators, we could not really manage the patients with these ventilators, at least not the complicated patients. We were, by the way, most of the patients with COVID. And then we had also masks and masks that were delivered. So our hospital was blessed that we have no shortage of, uh, of protective equipment at any time. And these were masks that came in to us uh, from the national stockpile, as well as some of the medications that were delivered, such as fluids and, and, and mostly fluids and some other equipment, such as gowns or, or again, additional masks. So the medications become an issue because there is, we're, we're accustomed to practice in a world in which we want people with pain control, sedation, and we want three different medications to attain those particular elements. And as Dr. Doyle had said before, um, there was a, a little bit of a problem for medications that we don't use typically, and, and, and you know we don't know how to use them sometimes, and they can be very resourceful in this kind of situation. So medications such as the, the common medications become really important and we have to restrict them. Why? Well, because they're in a shortage and we can allow everybody to use them in a liberal way as they normally do, which is okay, the way we do it in the standard times, but it's, this has become really uh, uh, completely different. And obviously we have to do very, very much control of novel medications, research medications, and we have to create task forces, protocols, or even an ethics committee to decide who gets what and when. Now, there are other elements that we had discussed. There's a lot of publications. Well, we do ECMO, we do nitric oxide, we do, but, but those require significant, significant attention to one single patient and also significant deviation of resources. Sometimes you can't do that, as simple as that. You can't, because if you employ that in one patient, then 10 other people are going to suffer the consequences of not being treated. And so you have to distribute that and, and apply concepts on ethics that are sometimes very difficult for physicians. And then you have to have an ethics committee. Let's talk a little bit about space. A space is not as simple as it looks like. Not every space in the house is prepared to carry an ICU. And you have a specific elements. And one of the problems that we've seen in some of the facilities is both mortality and morbidity had increased because of the lack of an adequate spice separation. As Dr. Boyle had mentioned before, it is recommended that a patient that goes with COVID into the OR gets out of the OR with a negative pressure and it gets transported somewhere else. Why? Well, because there's significant uh, spread of aerosols. And unfortunately, we've seen multiple images in which patients with COVID are together one-to-one, -one, uh, separated by a single curtain 
and and that is obviously a recipe for disaster because the transmission of the disease is going to continue and the healthcare workers are also tremendously exposed like that so preparing an adequate space planning ahead and this is this pandemic has taught us an important lesson about to prepare ahead so for the next one we need to prepare ahead and think about what we're going to do if another situation like this happens what area should be the next one to use, et cetera. Now, design and plan. Design and plan what you have in your hands and what can you do to make it better, to contain, to contain the problem, to add supplies. It is important to have an ICU that is reachable, is reachable to have supplies, and also to protect not only your patients, but your healthcare workers. Now, Protecting the healthcare workers have become a major issue for us. So these are different examples. You see there the red lines indicate areas that are contaminated. They are outside the room, but we consider those areas contaminated. They're not as contaminated as inside the room because inside the room is aerosol, whereas these areas could be dirty elements. Anytime you get into this red zone, you have to wear protective equipment. Now, the one in the middle is an example of a protecting equipment for aerosol management on airway management. Now, that's not necessarily what we use for every one of our patients, but that's just an example of maintaining. Every time one of our nurses go inside one of the rooms, there is an observant. So for each one of every particular number of beds, typically eight beds, we have a person that is observing the elements of what happened, how the interactions occur, and guarantee the safety of the healthcare personnel as much as we can. We seal spaces to create, again, close and closure areas for the management. So we have hallways in which we have essentially locked in and created a space. We have areas that are what we call yellow zone, and the yellow zone means that you have to wear one layer of protection when you get in. And then if you get into the room, you get a second layer of protection. But then it also becomes what is an adequate space. Adequate space has to be enough to transfer patient from bed to bed. And, and, and again, this is luxurious. I know that sometimes we can't have that. Also, it has to be enough space to allow resuscitation efforts. I've seen multiple times when we have patients placed somewhere and suddenly they can't really be resuscitated because you don't have a space to intubate someone and enough a space to allow for an MAMU mask usage or to produce any kind of procedures. And finally, the structure of your institution needs to have the ability to handle this situation with a command center, with a line of communication. It is very important because sometimes we don't have a structure of leadership and that becomes then an issue with a little bit of an anarchy on what does what we do. So who knows what available rooms are in the house who knows what ventilators are or how many are left then we have to have an ethics committee and the ethics committee doesn't have to be something that is formed there forever it could be really just called for the disaster management but one of the things every institution needs to have is the consideration and the next disaster happens the ethics committee is going to be composed by these 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 and these people and call them if it's necessary or call them continuously. It's up to every institution, but at least have the availability to create an ethics committee that guarantees that the performance of any particular uh, treatment or any particular even research is done under the most strict ethics criteria. And then a command structure and finally consider the possibility of external help. But again, external help in the pandemic hasn't happened as much as we thought or expected because again everybody was involved with this pandemic so unfortunately we really couldn't count with each other more than what we did there is an important uh, document that we created which is the triage and allocation of icu resources during a catastrophe and and this is something that we did and i really call for every possible uh, available institution to do similarly because it's important to have everything prepared in case of a disaster in order to maintain uh, the trust of your healthcare workers and 
the ability to deliver care without any bias or any ethical uh, uh, differences. And finally, I'm going to just finish saying, I mean, plan everything ahead, prepare yourself for the worst and simply hope for the best, but always prepare for the worst for sure. Thank you so much for your attention. I'm done with this. Thank you, Dr. Fernandez, uh, for your very informative um, lecture. And uh, in summary, you presented the three S's of a disaster ICU augmentation response, which are staff, stuff, and space. Um, within the staff, um, the tiered model, the stuff, the challenges of um, putting things on a stockpile and the different um, considerations that we need to have. And also within the space, the ICU um, area is having also a uh, leadership structure, not only within the space, but also a leadership structure within the institution. So um, I have a couple of questions for you. And to start with, um, what is regarding your experience with disasters and comparing COVID-19, what is new and something that we had not anticipated within our disaster planning structure? Um, what is old also, but focus more on the what is new? Well, I think this is, the, this is kind of, a, to me, it's, it's very similar to the tale of the wolf. We were always saying this was going to happen and we never believed this was coming. So, and I think it finally came. And it came to us and it got us uh, very distracted in many elements. So equipment to me was a major issue because again, we were all trusting and confident that you know, all the ventilators that we had were more than enough and we realized they were not. And we were also, very confident that our supply chain was never going to be jeopardized, that we're always going to have masks and fluids and oxygen. And those were elements that we never really considered um, ever to be limited or jeopardized in, in any possibility. And we realized that, yes, you know, because our, our supply chain coming from every element and for every other country, from every region was all jeopardized. And we, also realize that things need to be prepared stronger than a stronger way prior to these elements to happen. And I'm talking about uh, um, hospitals getting together and institutions and the societies also getting together to help to help to cope with these situations on a better way. We found a significant amount of different misinformation and uh, coming from people that were not even physicians or clinicians at all. Mm -hmm. and, and listening to, uh, unfortunately, politicians one way or another saying or telling us uh, what to do and politicians not listening to us and what they needed to do. And, and that to me is, is something that we really need to make an emphasis to change in the future. I mean, we are the ones, and at the end, let me tell you, because I think this is very important, at the end, Despite everything that we heard and we did and we and we you know discussed, we, we all came to do the same thing that we always do, individualize the care of our patients, look at our patients one by one, make an effort to deliver the best ventilator strategies to each one of our patients, whether we're elderly, younger, uh, or 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 the children uh, we're looking at. And and at the end, it, it comes to the same aspect we had to deliver critical care the way we know to deliver critical care and, and not to listen to, to mega politicians. I'm gonna use the logo here, mega politicians telling us what to do because they were wrong, simple. And, and, and no one was really right in any aspect. And, and again, this is not a political assertion. This is a reality that we all live in the frustration of listening to people that they don't know anything about medicine telling us what to do and realizing that they were wrong. And I think this is something that we really need to focus now before another pandemic hits us or another you know, catastrophe is affecting us. I think the, the governments and the institution need to learn to listen to us because we're definitely except for any political bias. We're just looking at our experience and telling people how to do things better to save lives. And that's at the end what we want, what we all want here. Now that you keep talking about that, you're talking about that and the politicians, 
what do you think the role of social media was with the pandemic? Do you think it helped us or do you think it harmed us? Or well, both? I think, I think both. I think both. I mean, I think, uh, I think we had also, uh, we also realized something important. There was a lack of control on the social media. I think social media allows us to express things outside the channels of, uh, for the government. And, uh, and, and, you know, I think this is very, very, very important, very important. But at the same time, I think uh, we need to control the information transmitted on social media because we were completely flooded by, again, misinformation and, and things. Again, people were able to, to discuss, well, I've done this. I have a very important research. I've done it in three patients, and this is what happened. Come on, we never really done research like that. I mean, and at the end, we, we discarded every one of those elements. Again, we went back to the roots of what we have done for years and centuries, and actually millenniums. And, and so we don't do that. I mean, I don't, I don't put a New England Journal of Medicine is never going to accept me publish, uh, you know, publishing something that I've done with one patient, a <laughs> research study with one patient. Uh, that's not serious, right? Now, social media was able to get those messages on the street. And the problem is it, it multiplied rapidly. And then a million people, a million people is able to, uh, to, to go and do that. And, uh, and that's, that's the problem. So, but, but at the same time, I think it's important to regulate social media and allow the media to, uh, to give us some perspective because that's an element that we can reach that sometimes we won't be able to go into the regular channels. And um, one last question before we go to our next speaker. Um, we've spoken about the three S's, the staff, the stuff, the space. Um, and uh, when you see monitoring, we see that, oh, we have this amount of ICU beds, this amount of ventilators. We never talk about how many healthcare professionals we have. And uh, in disaster, usually you have a disaster, it ends and you do a debriefing. But this is something that our generation has not experienced. It's been a, more than a year. When are we going to do the debriefing and when are we going to attend the psychological impact of our, of our healthcare personnel? And I think this is a very important point, Lori. I think that the, the problem is, again, here's another example of something that we've never been prepared to deal with, okay? And, and, and you know, the first article that I mentioned there, and I put there in the newspaper from India, the Tribune, reflects that they need 500,000 beds, but they also need 350 medical staff personnel to deal with ICU. Mm -hmm. and, and the problem is that we've been dealing with this for 15 months or 18 months some places. And, and it's the same people, and it is the same people. And, and, and this is a war. And unfortunately, uh, we're the soldiers. And yep. some, of, some of us are officials, if you want to call it that, that but some, of, some, some they're being also in the trenches. And everybody's exhausted, and everybody's exhausted, and no one sees, again, the solution. And I think this is a good moment to ask, again, our societies, our 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 peers and colleagues to look into what can we do, if anything, to help our current personnel and also to, first, to help future generations that are looking at us and saying, I don't want to be an intensivist because look, look at the crap that happened to these people. Okay, look, look at what happened. Look, look at the way they're living right now. And I don't want to be an intensivist. I don't want to work in ICU. And again, I'm not saying that's the right thing, but it must be some form of solution that we all have to work together to create. And also, as you said, to briefing, uh, counseling, support. And, and I think this is a good, very important issue. And I think it's something to tackle in the future. Yes, definitely. In the present, not in the future. I agree. Uh, I have think a, Dr. Hazim Yassin. Has a uh, question, yeah. Hazim, yeah, has a question. Good afternoon. You hear me? Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, uh, for the uh, uh, presentation. I think uh, I cannot say it's a presentation. I think it's a success story. 
more than patient. And I feel uh, as a whole, uh, we're thrown to the tea of that disaster. Uh, I think each slide uh, to have presented uh, expressed uh, more than our days, weeks uh, of great effort uh, fighting uh, this curve. Uh, really, I'm very impressed about the presentation and about the information about the Successfully uh, as a sample of uh, healthcare workers suffering uh, the last uh, 14 months. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for your comments and. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Perez Fernandez, for your lecture, and uh, we'll keep on the conversation um, in the in the website.